Part of what makes kayaking so enjoyable is that we recreate with the force of nature in a wild space. The environment we play in is a fantastic mess of rock, flora, fauna, and water. The way we paddle is often an adaptation to these environments. We are adjusting to variations in gradients, volume, even the type of geology and local ecology in our riverbed. The river itself is part of a much larger system called a watershed. And because we are hoping to take advantage of water traveling through these fantastic formations, we first should understand how they work. A watershed, by definition, is an area of land where all the water that falls into it drains off to a common outlet. Watersheds can be as small as one small stream to as large as an area of land that drains water into a river, into a bay, and ultimately into the ocean. Also synonymous with drainages, catchments, or basins, they are divided by ridges called a drainage divide. Watersheds consist of all surface water such as lakes, streams, reservoirs, and wetlands, and all of the underlying groundwater. So why is any of this important? In order to determine whether or not you're gonna have a runnable flow, you have to figure out where the water is and how quickly it's getting there. Determining what a stream flow will be is determined by a number of factors, which include how hard and fast it is raining and for how long, where the rain event is occurring and moving to and how fast or slow it is moving, how porous is the surface it is raining on and how saturated is it already, how much vegetation is covering the soil, and other factors such as storage through lakes, reservoirs, snow, and ice, and the associated infiltration and evaporation that occurs. Sounds complicated, right? While you certainly can go down the rabbit hole here with too much information, what we're actually looking for here is finding out if an area is in drought, whether it's primed for good flows, or whether it's prone to flash flooding. Keeping a close eye on the conditions leading up to your trip, not only during the time of your trip, is going to be pertinent as well. Figuring out which parts of the watershed are more prone to flash flooding, or just doing a little bit of history research on an area will go a long way in getting yourself ready for your trip. Generally speaking, we have low water, normal flows, bank filled or high water, and flood dynamics. Flooding can occur over a matter of minutes, such as flash flooding, or slowly over a period of weeks. What is important to grasp is how each stream level affects the river dynamics that we have become familiar with, and ultimately, how we proceed with the group. High water can be some of the highest grade fun in whitewater kayaking, but because of the increase in speed and therefore decision making, may not make the greatest venue for a large group that requires a great deal of communication. On the flip side, a group that is very familiar with one another and has worked through contingencies in the past can really thrive and enjoy the experience. A great resource to use for further research is NOAA's National Weather Service in conjunction with American Whitewater's River Database. If you truly want to take a dive off the deep end, check out watershed maps on the USGS Edna page for a Google Earth download. Study soil moisture levels on the NOAA site. Understand correlations. I think you're starting to get the picture. Your mind should be an ever-broadening encyclopedia of river knowledge, especially as you start to increase the difficulty and or the elusiveness of a particular reach. Below in the description, you can check out some of the links to some of the resources we were discussing before. Water is very clearly the main ingredient, but what it flows over and how is what determines the remainder of our preparation. The three main ingredients we need to keep in mind for the difficulty of white water are flow, gradient, and obstacles. Difficulty correlates differently to the variance of these three things, but realize that the difficulty increases directly to the increase of all three. The way we paddle is often an adaptation to these environments, and a basic understanding of those three characteristics in the region you are in warrants different strategies. A river with exposed granite bedrock may yield steep, shallow slides with uniform, retentive features, especially as flow is increased. 
and due to the bedrock, you may or may not see riverside vegetation that can result in strainers, but instead see hazards like potholes and caves. How does this affect your technique, your group management and communication, your safety and equipment? How about the differences in the types of geology we encounter from region to region? Sometimes awareness of local ecology is pertinent, such as the hemlock woolly adelgid in the eastern U.S., which is effectively killing a majority of hemlocks and as a result, putting them into the streams an increasing hazard. No doubt this seems like overpreparedness, but it depends on how fringe you intend to be with your endeavor. Rivers change, and that's why it's so important for us to remain attentive, vigilant students of our river environments to avoid getting caught off guard. Differences in geographic region may contribute to your decisions on what equipment to use and how the group moves downstream. Every new location provides a new insight into the act of river running. One final point we need to make in regards to this topic and is a bit more abstract, access. From a trip leader perspective, the most pressing issue will be in the case of group and personal safety and access points if this were to become compromised. Having an emergency action plan in place may be overkill in many instances, but simple things as a group being aware of which side of the river to hike out on are absolutely pertinent. Trails, railroads, logging roads, nearest town and trauma center are all things that should be thought of in advance, as our cell phones aren't necessarily going to have the service we are used to in river gorges. Further, knowing about access from a legal perspective can help keep you out of trouble with the locals and help prevent future problems with utilizing particular river reaches. Don't expect that access from one state to the next or from country to country to be universal either. If you ever wondered how good it is to have organizations such as American Whitewater or Green River Access Fund working on your behalf, all it takes is one international trip to bring it to light. It goes without saying that it is imperative to protect the natural resource we are exploiting. And that starts with leaving a small footprint. All of these natural and man-made elements are going to interplay with group dynamic as well as individual performance. Be sure to plan for contingencies for dwindling morale or waning energy at the end of the day. I find a little bit of chocolate goes a long way. <laughs>